It's a cottage Thank you. Hello and welcome to the final section of Psychology of Thinking. Thus far, we've addressed two out of the three acts of mind enumerated by ancient philosophy, understanding and reasoning. Our understanding is quite flawed due to our imperfect memory, the shortcuts our brain employs, our need to protect our beliefs, and situational concerns like priming and framing. Our reasoning is far from ideal for all of the same reasons, but when these issues arise, in the reasoning process, they can be even more harmful because reasoning is supposed to be the process that protects us from our flawed brains. Reasoning should be the emergency exit to save us from when we are wrong, but we often find a way to make our fire escape lead right back into the burning room we should be fleeing. Reasoning tools we have include making our beliefs explicit and specific, observing the whole spectrum of reality, not just what makes us comfortable, seeing whether our beliefs follow validly from the reasons that we give for them, opening ourselves to the hardest possible tests of our belief, and accepting that observations that contradict our beliefs ought to change our beliefs. These are a bunch of the tools of reasoning that should protect us from our limitations and biases, but our limitations and biases often get incorporated into the reasoning process such that we think we have protection against error and this increases our conviction of this with words like logical and proven but we have not it is as though we are presuming to hold a magnifying glass up to reality when we are actually magnifying our preconceptions and saying, now I see the truth. I find this magnifying glass meme or metaphor useful when in conversation people respond to new information or new arguments with descriptions of what they previously thought or how they understood the issue before the introduction of new information. The predictable result of this response to new information is that the prior belief will be reinforced and they'll fail to incorporate the new information. So the respondent is acting as if the new information is being magnified by their thinking about their prior beliefs, but they are in fact just magnifying those prior beliefs. The correct way to respond to the statement, the moon is made of rock because we went there and we got some of it and brought it back. You can even touch it if you want. The constructive way to respond to that statement is not well, I thought it was made of cheese because it looks similar to cheese and my mother told me it was made of cheese and in terms of understanding, you are strengthening the erroneous prior belief or memory trace while simultaneously preventing processing of the new information. And in terms of reasoning, you are at best trying but failing to reason and at worst willfully avoiding information that could save you from error while pretending that this is the reasonable course of action. When we pretend to reason, all the while failing to accept the logical task and misinterpreting conflict syllogisms, we increase our certainty in our beliefs, turning what could have been a fire escape into a return to the inferno of error. But who's to say that, well, who's to say what is an error? Given the pessimistic meta-induction from the history of science, should we not all just admit that nobody knows what the truth is? Well, yes and no. Mostly no. The third act of the mind, of course, is judging. So far, we have learned only a few things about judgment. That judgment involves decisions about the truth, so how to act in, in response to, to truth. Normal logic does not deal with judging. Deductive logic presumes the certainty of its premises, and, and inductive logic just as a general acknowledgement that its conclusions come with unavoidable risk of being wrong, so the sun could not rise tomorrow and our judgments are potentially quite skewed towards earlier learning and first impressions because understanding our, our processing and our memory of things does not change as much as it should in response to important later information. So the third act of this course is the third act of the mind, judging. Here's a quote from Bertrand Russell. The whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, but wiser people so full of doubts. What do we do about this? We can take some basic logic to this and we can see, well, the fix is not to make wiser people more certain of themselves. Well, why? Well, because the statement is, if wise, then uncertain, even though it might be easy to misread it as, if uncertain, then wise. So we have our two valid and two invalid things that we can do with the if-then statement, if wise, then uncertain. You can A the A and D the C, but you can't D the A or A the C. So the valid things that we're allowed to do with this if-then statement, wise, therefore uncertain, affirm the antecedent. The wiser people are full of doubts. This is precisely what Russell is saying. The other valid thing we're allowed to do with this, not uncertain, therefore unwise. 
so denying the consequent. If the, if the person is certain, they must not be wise, since wise people are uncertain. So what invalid things are we allowed to do with this if-then statement, which is if wise, then uncertain. So the invalid things we're, we're not allowed to do. Not wise, therefore not uncertain, so denying the antecedent. It's fairly obvious that Russell is not saying in the quote that unwise people are necessarily certain, although that this would be what he's saying if we take the rest of the quote and we assume that he is saying that all people are either fools slash fanatics or wise, but I don't think that that could be read into the quote. Anyway, the other invalid move in interpreting the if-then statement, if wise then uncertain, would be uncertain, therefore wise, affirming the consequent. And this would be the tempting one. This would be the error that we might want to make, uncertain, therefore wise. So this last invalid move uh, is the one that undergraduates tend to make when they think they can become wise by rejecting knowledge and perspectives rather than by understanding them or rather by only understanding that some people might find things wrong with them. So, so uncertainty might be in demand somewhere, but this does not make it wisdom. And wiser people are uncertain, but this does not make uncertain people necessarily wise. But this is, of course, just a review of the logic that we've already covered. The quote above introduces the third act of the course because what remains is how to deal with uncertainty. So we're now wise beyond our years in terms of knowing how our understanding can be flawed and how our reasoning can be scientifically deployed to guard effectively against these flaws. If wise, and we are now wise, if wise then uncertain. So, we now need to figure out how to manage our uncertainty and engage in wise judgment. First task, which is today's task, is we will tackle a rudimentary understanding of probability. How we build up to a probabilistic understanding of the world as individuals. We'll learn some elementary tools uh, with which we can think some places where we have problems with probability, and some ways to address these problems. After this one, the last two lectures tackle judgment in the context of problem solving and expertise. Epistemology refers to our theory of how we know things. As we grow as an individual or as a society, our epistemology becomes increasingly concerned with distinguishing well-justified beliefs, or what some pithily call facts, from less supported or unsupported beliefs, or what we might call opinions. This growth is generally called development, which is change and refinement, uh, usually positive change and refinement, uh, though not necessarily, uh, as time and experience increase. Note that the apotheosis, or the highest point of this development process, is not necessarily rejecting all unsupported beliefs or only accepting supported ones. We don't get to find support for a lot of the things that we have to make decisions about. What we do with our increasingly developed epistemology is still up to us, and how we morally judge the goodness or badness of epistemology and the changes that we make is, is still up to us. In other words, the development of our epistemology is not towards any given conclusion, but towards different or better approaches, standards, or processes. Note also that when we are talking about human development, this tends to mean the addition of skills, strategies, or abilities, not the wholesale replacement of previous ones with newer ones. Some notes on the development of our epistemology. First, the warrant or the justification for calling the change in epistemology development. We call it development because the change or growth we observe helps us to better interact with the world. All three of the major philosophical forces in psychology, psychodynamic, behaviorist, and humanist, and any of the biological approaches which would follow evolutionary theory, have observed that the health or well-being of the individual is a function of the accuracy of one's representation of reality. For the psychodynamicists, your pathology is a function of how much or how often, in order to avoid anxiety, your ego defense mechanisms tend to distort reality. For behaviorists, effective behavior is that which is rewarded by the environment, so to survive one should be wired Firstly, to be rewarded for actions that help survival. Secondly, to discriminate behaviors that are effective from those that are not. 
and thirdly to change or to extinguish our behavior when the environment or the rewards change. So to do any of this one needs to consistently identify and differentiate aspects of reality as reality is what things and rewards are made of. For humanists, especially Rogerian person-centered therapists, the idea of your own personal growth being a function of accuracy is called correspondence. In order to grow to our natural potential, we need to be able to see and understand in our own terms how our idea of ourself corresponds or does not correspond to how we actually act in the world. We will naturally work to narrow the gap between our idea of ourselves and the reality of ourselves. And, and this happens just if we're simply allowed to clearly see the unpleasant lack of correspondence. Humanistic therapists generally are non-directive, meaning that they leave this process up to the client, whereas more popular cognitive behavioral therapies work to confront inaccurate and unhelpful thinking more directly or efficiently. The third wave CBT approaches like acceptance and commitment therapy, which gets people to accept their condition, warts and all, and dialectical behavioral therapy, which shows clients the range of their self-contradictions, especially their emotional self-contradictions, in the hopes that their clients can put together a coherent reality-based center. So we've added CBT uh, along with psychodynamic behaviors and humanist approaches because the idea is the same, to, to align thoughts with what would work in reality. Biological Logical approaches similarly see things like perceptual systems and their resultant behaviors or beliefs. If these perceptual systems don't lead to effective actions, then they are essentially evolutionarily wrong in the sense that if one does not survive to procreate and have offspring that also survive to procreate, then one's genes die out. So in other words, your, your eyes or ears and your brain have failed to keep your genes alive if they did not respond to reality uh, in a way that makes you reproduce. So this doesn't mean that survival or survival promoting actions are morally good, just that those are the mechanisms that surviving organisms have evolved in order to be here and will continue to have for eons if they survive, whether we like these mechanisms or not, and whether we bother to understand or acknowledge them or not. Now, across all of these models, moving one's individual epistemology, one's individual theory of how one knows, from simply seeing or hearing and accepting toward distinguishing the strength or accuracy of one's knowledge is developing. Developing insight, reality testing. For psychodynamicists, it is developing a more mature personality with less use of what they call primal or even psychotic defense mechanisms, which just means ones that are developmentally younger, ones you might have used as, as a baby or an infant or a toddler that don't look great if you use them as an adult. For behaviorists, it is discriminating between and generalizing across that which rewards and that which does not. For humanists, developing is having a self-concept that corresponds with reality, so one can self-actualize one's truest desires. For CBT, it's having effective beliefs, usually less negative ones, to better act in the world. And for biological approaches, development is, is aligning behavior with effective survival, mating, investment, and offspring. So the idea here is more accurate views of the world are more developed and healthier views of the world. So I could mention two exceptions, at least here, to the more accurate is more developed idea. Two non-signatories to the more accurate is more developed notion. One being uh, any theory, any theory that supports the idea of a golden lie or a noble lie. So, so in other words, some approaches, and only some approaches, uh, believe that some knowledge could be dangerous, discomforting, or misinterpreted. So it is the responsibility of those who know these facts to hide them from others. In psychology, this has been the case, for example, with a limited, limited set of approaches feminist approaches that simultaneously attempted to argue away or censor observations of sex differences and misinform textbook readers about the findings and actual approaches of evolutionary and biopsychology generally. Another example would be Viktor Frankl's logotherapy, which assumes, or at least one aspect of it, uh, assumes that we should overestimate the positive potential of individuals uh, and of society in general uh, uh, in order to affect the most positive change possible. These examples are just to show that there are exceptions in psychology to the more accurate is more healthy or well idea, uh, but the idea is central to nearly every perspective that has cared about improving thought, emotion, and behavior. A second note on the development of our epistemology, underlying this notion that accuracy regarding reality is both objectively and subjectively good for people is a notion that sometimes 
it could be used to argue its opposite, uh, as uh, might might be the case with Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. Pragmatism uh, argues that reason arrives at truth by testing the efficacy of one's actions. Sounds pretty good. Uh, more deeply, uh, for something to be meaningful and therefore have a chance of being true, it would have to be capable of being put into practice. And that practice should be somewhat successful in order to convince us to keep accepting something as truth. This is the deeper substrate uh, of Dr. Phil's deep cutting question, how's that working for you? Uh, in part, this is an effective question because it shows that something that likely was working at one point, maybe venting frustrations by bullying other people, which can feel good in the moment, uh, is now not working or backfiring. So if someone is uh, coming to see you for counseling or consultation, then something is indeed not working, so that's, which makes this a handy go-to question when one finds one's clients or oneself uh, resisting change or rationalizing prior behavior, i.e. looking at one's behaviors or thoughts uh, only through the default self-magnifying lens of uh, confirmation bias. Sticking with Dr. Phil, his self-help model is pretty much three questions. What are you doing that is working, which is important to start with uh, to get people observing their life and seeing examples of things that work? Two, what do you need to stop doing that's getting in the way of what you want? Three, what do you need to start doing to get what you want. This is pragmatism, or at least the most shallow form of it. Uh, essentially, you need to cycle through the System 2 reasoning process a few more times to update your knowledge so that your behaviors change. Uh, Dr. Phil also has a rule, deal only with the truth, which uh, should serve to confirm his place amongst the uh, more accurate is more healthy and well uh, crowd. Before we get to the deeper form of pragmatism, which is far more interesting and less commonsensical, we should look at the steps involved in cycling through the reasoning process. So for Charles Sanders Peirce, pictured on the left, uh, reasoning has three parts. It, if he, basically everything had three parts for Charles Sanders Peirce. He loved trichotomies. Uh, nearly everything in his philosophy has three parts. So reasoning has three parts. Abduction, deduction and induction. We start with the knowledge soup. So it's a little pot there, the quasi organized mass of what we know. And from it, we hypothesize. And that's the definition of abduction is just the process of hypothesizing. His earlier work, he called it hypothesis. Uh, and then he realized that's a little confusing because it was actually the process of hypothesizing. So then he called it abduction. Please note, because it's a cool image that I'll, I'll unpack a bit, but this is this image is just the tiny corner of Pierce's work that is his three parts of reasoning. Uh, all the other concepts are, you know, absent from this. So let's uh, run through a quick case using our Dr. Phil example, the person who is bullying others. So, so let's say uh, Karen has the idea that she is uh, better than her younger sibling, Susan. So there's plenty of observation over the course of their lives that would support the induction of this rule. So especially since Karen's the older sibling, she would have been ahead of Susan for much of their lives. Moreover, let's assume that Karen finds a superiority over Susan to be meaningful to her self-concept. So it's something that comes up in her thinking from time to time. Uh, more specifically, recalling this rule makes Karen feel better about herself. So Karen has a rule then, I am or I must be uh, better than Susan. F following this rule, any result observed should be that Karen on task X does better than Susan and any cases of task X we observe should see Karen as being better than Susan. When this induced rule and its corresponding abducted uh, hypotheses are transformed into deductions, uh, they read as uh, Karen is always better than Susan. So this is our universal affirmative uh, in the deductive statement. The next premise would be X is something that Susan has just done, for example. So, so a case of, of task X uh, and the prediction before we see how Susan has done would be, therefore Susan will not have done X as well as Karen. To keep this deduction from being falsified, Karen's imperfect human brain can be overly critical of Susan. Uh, she could inflate her Karen's own ability or otherwise, you know, make excuses or seek exceptions. The bullying 
because that was a problem, Karen was bullying Susan. The bullying might come from Karen being overly critical in this case. Maybe that criticism has actually worked in the past. So maybe when they were younger, when Susan tried something and showed promise, Karen would discourage Susan from doing it again, thus preventing Susan from getting better so that she was never better than Karen at anything. Karen could also fail to falsify her deduction that she made. So, so let's say we're in the reality where Susan is actually doing something better than Karen. Karen could fail to falsify the deduction by using the magnifying glass, right? By magnifying her own preconceptions to distract herself from learning about this new bit of reality. So maybe Karen starts listing all the things that, that Karen is good at, saying, saying something like, well, Susan just did X pretty well. But Susan is the person who failed at Y and Z. And well, I did a great job on Y and Z with very little effort, and but but she did poorly on them. So she's, she's distracting her brain from being able to learn uh, from the world about X uh, by magnifying her thoughts or her own preconceptions, which, which by, by reiterating the things that she's better at uh, than Karen uh, instead. Uh, despite what Karen might do to prevent herself from learning. Both Dr. Phil and Charles Pierce believe that the world resists error. In other words, as long as Karen keeps looking, she will eventually be forced by reality to concede that her belief in her own superiority over Susan is not working as an effective belief. Maybe it worked in the past be because it was either correct or led Karen to effectively sabotage Susan, but as long as Susan outperforms Karen in something, Karen's incorrect belief will be chipped away at until it is amended. And it is this amendment process usually that's the task of therapies. Who, who am I uh, and what is my value if I'm not better than Susan? It's this, uh, this, this deeper level of pragmatism that's getting uh, more popular in things like addictions treatment. So uh, why would a fruit fly, deprived of mating, start drinking too much alcohol? Uh, it is refused satisfaction in one place, and so it seeks it in another. W why might Karen start drinking? Because Susan's success removes part of how Karen got her satisfaction. At this point, Karen needs some new actions from which she can induce that satisfaction. And, and, and alcohol or other drugs are often effective counterfeit forms of satisfaction. Depth psychology would attempt to tease out why Karen gets meaning or fulfillment from Susan's failures, while most other approaches would start with uh, substituting the, the deductions. So, for example, uh, correcting the belief, I need a drink, or behaviors, so punishing drinking, or with like, maybe like with ant abuse, uh, or rewarding some substitute behavior. So exercise would be ideal. Uh, and then the uh, Psychodynamics might call the complex. The complex that Karen has could work itself out as she learns via induction conclusions from observing herself that other things besides alcohol or besides her comparison with herself and Susan uh, can fulfill whatever need she had. This is pragmatism. We will and do believe what works, but as the philosopher Pierce pointed out, it is what works according to what is meaningful to us. Karen has a need addressed by her either through bullying Susan or drinking alcohol. And the need comes from having found meaning in being better than Susan or, or a substitute satisfaction from the depressant effects of alcohol. It may be the case that in order to help Karen or to help relapsing individuals with addictions, we need to address this void of meaning. This is one of the reasons why research into single treatment hallucinogen sessions for addictions has returned uh, since going away after a brief stint in the 60s. It may be that the quickest way to find whatever profundity one's specific life is lacking, for example, what question was Karen is always better than Susan answering? What, what challenge is I just need a drink distracting us from? Uh, what insecurities are our justifications for procrastination uh, preventing us from encountering? The point here is that this is all actually baked into the philosophy of pragmatism. That which can be put into practice and found to be effective is true. So, by aligning ourselves to reality, we are not just making ourselves better adapted to the world, we are 
also putting truth into the world through our actions, truth that is aligned with what we find meaningful. Before you conclude that that sounds hokey, consider the example. If Karen induces that all volunteers seem to have meaning in their lives, then abductively uh, she hypothesizes that volunteering with Meals on Wheels would bring her satisfaction, her consequent deduction, volunteering brings me satisfaction, could lead to many actions and observations that do not just change her own knowledge, but the observable knowledge of others. And if her deduction is correct, and this is observable by others, she is influencing the truth, uh, or at least knowledge of it, in the direction of her belief, because it leads to action and is effective. So, so in other words, pe people see her being fulfilled and having satisfaction, and that makes not just her own knowledge of volunteering leading to satisfaction more true, but also potentially other people's knowledge of this fact more true as well. Of course, the flip side here is that she could also uh, turn out to hate volunteering and thus contribute to falsifying her induced rule that all volunteers have meaning in their lives. Either way, pragmatism cares about what you put into the world and how it helps to make the truth. And, and it does this without falling into either naive realism or subjectivism or relativism. More on that in the next slide, but first, it was... Uh, mentioned that pragmatism could be used to argue that accurately regarding reality is not both objectively and subjectively good for people. Okay, how? One of Frankel's logotherapy ideas is that having uh, unrealistically high expectations for people helps them to actually accomplish their highest real potential. In other words, inaccurate beliefs lead to the best results. Uh, pragmatism has no trouble uh, showing this to be either true or false, depending on how Frankel's therapy actually does. So, so note that this would not, not make the unrealistic expectations accurate. They're still unrealistic, but rather it would demonstrate that aligning oneself to reality, uh, i.e. more accurate is more healthy. Uh, is in fact not the best approach, uh, and self or other deception yields the most health and wellness. Uh, so, so logotherapy is all about finding and nurturing what is meaningful to you. So Pierce and his often like-minded contemporary William James uh, would likely have no problem admitting its potential value. So aligning to reality, especially when this is hard, is the target of most psychology, and the uh, pragmatic philosophy undergirding most of psychology acknowledges that it is the results of your attempting to do this, of your attempting to line up with reality, that determine the truth. And so they acknowledge that you have to pay attention and you have to cycle through the reasoning process. This brings us to our developmental model of epistemology. Uh, first of all, since this is development, we could start with Jean Piaget, who noted that we reorganize our knowledge schemes only as necessary. So in other words, it is only when we encounter a failure of our ability to act or understand effectively that we engage in accommodation. If, if our schemas are performing fine, we are in equilibrium with the world. If they start failing us, we experience disequilibrium and change our thinking. That process is occurring at all stages of this model, uh, summarized in uh, Deanna Kuhn's great textbook, Education for Thinking. Now, since this is a stages model, we should remind ourselves that passing a stage does not mean uh, leaving it entirely behind. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould noted our tendency to focus on what's new in a given stage and forget what was already there and, and never left or, or never leaves. His example was that images of the Cretaceous period uh, depict the Tyrannosaurus rex be because uh, that's where we first find the T-Rex. But these images don't highlight things like the uh, coelacanths because coelacanths have been around since the Devonian period uh, and are still around today. Uh, so this leads people to forget that the coelacanths were also around in the Cretaceous period and, and they're still around today. Uh, playing an important role in their own ecosystem. The, the analogy with uh, epistemological development here is that we may develop new skills or priorities uh, at later stages, but that does not mean prior skills and priorities have left us. The Cretaceous period may have been the age of the T-Rex, big and bad and impressive, but surviving through the Cretaceous and even afterwards 
are the coelacanths. They never went away, despite being overshadowed by later, cooler things. That said, these are the stages that most of us develop through as we age and gain experience. The epistemological stages. First, realist. Something exists, therefore it is true. A, therefore A. Realist. Nice and simple. Ages 0 to 4 years old, you can expect this type of epistemology. Absolutist. Uh, something exists, therefore it is true. But some people could be wrong about it. So it's A, therefore A, but maybe sometimes B by accident. Multiplist. Multiple opinions exist, therefore they are true. Or false, or whatever. A and B, therefore A and B. Finally, evaluativist. Something exists and opinions exist, therefore we should see how well the opinions line up with the something. A and B, therefore A or B. Getting a little deeper now. Realist stage. Uh, truth goes from reality to person or people. And it's, it is not in our realm of consideration that this process could be broken or different for different people. Reality leads to truth. If I know that the cookies are in the cupboard and I know that Jenny wants a cookie, then I will be surprised, even, even as a toddler and an infant, if Jenny does not first look in the cupboard for the cookies. My knowledge should be everyone's knowledge. It's, it's, it's egocentrism. And we should all have the same beliefs because we all look at the same reality. Uh, in your intro psychology course, the textbook gives you a grown-up heuristic version of this and it calls it the curse of knowledge. We assume that others will know what we know. This assumption could be seen as the foundation of the enthymemetic argument from the uh, reasoning lecture. Uh, the Aristotelian enthymemetic argument, the hidden argument. So, so we have a hidden or unstated premises because we think everyone knows that, uh, in the example of the child arguing for a smart smartphone, uh, the fairness is everyone having the same thing. So we all move beyond realism, but we do not leave it entirely behind. Uh, even the philosophy of Pierce, as we just mentioned, includes the idea that reality is corrective. Re reality is resistant to error, which is a tenet that uh, Charles Pierce's philosophy shares with uh, realist philosophies. The absolutist stage of the school-aged child, or rather, which starts with the school-aged child. The school-aged child knows that people can be correct or incorrect about things, but holds the idea that this correctness is determined by the absolute correct or incorrect nature of beliefs. The idea that in reality things are either true or untrue. So two young children might have an argument over uh, which is bigger, the CN Tower or the Great Pyramid of Giza. Right or wrong is uh, not up for challenge. It, the issue of whether or not one of them needs to be wrong it, it is not going to be up for challenge. So, so, so try telling the, the, the kids that uh, uh, maybe the two of you mean two different things when you're saying bigger. Uh, like, see how poorly that goes. Uh, at, at, but at some point, they will understand the importance of this uh, question. Uh, the, the level of thinking here uh, is what's demonstrated when we say it's a fact, uh, as, as if that provides like a premise for a conclusion, so, which if, if, if we did state that, then it would just be circular reasoning uh, or begging the question. Uh, the, the, the statement is a fact is a placeholder for the actual evidence or demonstrability of that fact. Uh, 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 your conclusion is that X is a fact. A a an argument would consist in demonstrating how we know it's a fact. The, th the first pangs of this growth in kids seems to be the use of authority. So who said it? Uh, which is still something that we need to appeal to for most of our knowledge, unfortunately. So, like, for example, how do you... Uh, okay, let's think of one. H how do you personally know that broccoli is healthy for you and bacon isn't? Very few of us could break down a convincing argument that is not circular. 
so, so, uh, it's good for you because it has good things, vitamins in it, or an appeal to authority. So it's it's a vegetable, uh, and the Canada Food Guide says we need seven servings of vegetables per day. Or we might just uh, make an appeal to popularity, uh, or you know, fall victim to the bandwagon fallacy. So well, everybody learns that uh, broccoli is good for you. We learn from our parents or our caregivers. The uh, childlike idea of science as a body of facts is 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 also an example of this. So if science says so, then it's true or not true. It's this this is also probably just an example of absolutist thinking. And a significant fraction of us humans do not develop our epistemology past the absolutist stage, especially if we've latched on to a very good system of appealing to different authorities or appealing to one authority which does our thinking for us. But most of us move on to multiplist. So where were we previously? Things are either true or not true, and we can find that out through authority figures, or through appealing to science. Uh, so let's develop into a multiplist and, and say something like, what if science is just another opinion? Ah, well, welcome to the multiplist stage. In the absolutist stage, we, le we learned to appeal to authority, but, but by the time we get to the multiplist stage, we have likely learned that authorities contradict themselves. Any one authority could contradict itself internally. So uh, unfortunately, the Catholic Pope cannot be both infallible and apologetic for past Pope mistakes. Maybe we realize that our religious doctrines contradict themselves. The, the, the necessity of the religious meme to benefit followers uh, often comes in conflict with meeting the higher ideals of humanity and beneficence to all. Uh, or maybe we are the victim of an injustice at the hands of the system or an individual that we've had high regard for. Our particular stories aside, we learn that there are alternatives and that the very thing we used to choose uh, between the alternatives might be just another alternative. Uh, add to that the social emotional pressures of adolescence and one's epistemology often just washes out into the word whatever, whatever. If, 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 I, if I do not choose, then I cannot be wrong. If I have no beliefs, then I cannot harm or offend anyone with them. Uh, a truth is a matter of taste, culture, preference. We, we each choose our preferred truth, and it's silly or wrong to tell someone that they are wrong. Hmm. Oh wait, that, that that doesn't scan, does it? Uh, uh, and, and another challenge here is the magnitude of emotional response is, is, is huge when we're adolescents. We have trouble, even as adults, because uh, we conflate what feels emotionally wrong with what is empirically wrong and what's morally wrong. Uh, uh, as we've seen, for example, with conflict syllogisms, when, when we have trouble distinguishing what's logically wrong, if, it, if it's something with, we agree with or that something evokes emotion. Um, so you can combine that uh, entangled mess and, and then add in, you know, an overactive emotional reasoning heuristic. So, 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 well, the more I feel it, the more it must be true. Uh, and then we can, we can hardly blame you for escaping into the welcoming nihilism of whatever it, they, they, they need to. As some of you may remember, uh, being a multiplist is a terrible experience. So most of us do grow out of multiplism and, and further develop. Not all of us need to, though, if it doesn't serve our purpose to develop anything more than just a multiplist or uh, a relativistic uh, view of things. To transition to the evaluativist stage, I'm going to just quote Kuhn herself, uh, page 32. Hoisting oneself out of the whatever well of multiplicity and indiscriminability is much harder than the quick and easy fall into its depths. By adulthood, many, though by no means all, adolescents will have reintegrated with the objective dimension of knowing and achieved the understanding that, while everyone has a right to their opinion, some opinions are in fact more right than others, to the extent that they are better supported by argument and evidence. Justification for a belief becomes more than personal preference. Whatever is no longer the automatic response to any assertion, there are legitimate discriminations and choices to be made, rather than facts or opinions. Knowledge at this evaluativist level of epistemological understanding consists of judgments, which require support in a framework of alternatives, evidence, and argument. This cognitive evolution cannot, by itself, yield the valuing of intellectual engagement, but it does provide an essential foundation for its development. Adolescents who never progress beyond the absolutist belief in certain knowledge 
or the multiplist's equation of knowledge with personal preference lack a reason to engage in sustained intellectual inquiry. If facts can be ascertained with certainty and are readily available to anyone who seeks them, as an absolutist understands, or if any claim is as valid as any other, as the multiplist understands, there is little point to expending the mental effort that the evaluation of claims entails. Only at the evaluativist level are thinking and reason recognized as essential support for beliefs and actions. Thinking is the process that enables us to make informed choices between conflicting claims. Understanding this leads a person to value thinking and to be willing to expend the effort that it entails. So we, or at least many of us, have finally graduated to judgment, despite being so rewarded for rejecting it in our multiplist adolescence. Let's give ourselves some tools to work with. Probability concepts, some basics. First, what's probability? Well, it depends on who you ask. How often something tends to occur would be the answer that a frequentist would give. Uh, frequentism is kind of a limited set of a Bayesian approach. Uh, the Bayesian would say, well, probability is the measure of the strength of your belief. Uh, so this belief can be built on the number of times something has happened before, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. The most basic formula we have for probability is the number of outcomes x over the number of all possible outcomes. Uh, usually the numerator, and the numerator is the top bit here, the denominator is the bottom bit, usually the numerator is called the number of desired outcomes. Uh, but I, I don't think that applies in plenty of cases. So I just say number of outcomes x over number of all possible outcomes. Uh, so this yields us with a proportion then, because we divide the numerator by the denominator. Uh, in this case, we have a proportion of uh, 3 over 5 equals 0.6. So if this is, let's say I'm saying, what are the chances that my dentist would recommend this toothpaste? At the burning question, uh, well, th three out of five dentists surveyed said that they would recommend this toothpaste. So I, I might guess that there's a 60% chance that my specific dentist would recommend this toothpaste. But what I did there was I translated this proportion, which uh, proportion run, runs from, from 0 to 1, uh, to a percentage, which runs from 0 to 100, although you could have over 100 in, in specific contexts, just not in probability contexts. To get the percentage of a proportion, you just multiply it by 100. So let's use our new tool. Let's use our new tool like a Bayesian to figure out how confident we should be in something. Uh, we're thinking about a draw. Uh, uh, X could be the number of tickets that you purchased. Your chance of winning the draw would be X divided by the total number of tickets that were sold, including the ones that you bought. Uh, so if, if we're at a, a, a minor league hockey game and they have a fundraiser, a 50-50 draw, and we know that they sold uh, 433 tickets, maybe because they printed 500 and they have 67 left in their hands, uh, and you bought five of them, your chances of winning, or your confidence that you should have in winning, would be 5 divided by 433. So this yields a proportion of 0 0.0115, or a percentage of... 1.15 percent so your chance of winning is just the proportion of tickets sold that you purchased you should be about one percent confident uh, that you are going to win what this means pragmatically from a Bayesian standpoint where we're talking about confidence is that if someone comes up and wants to make a bet with you that you're going to lose the 50 50 draw so they're making a bet against you so you then would be betting on your winning the 50-50 draw. The only fair or even bet uh, would be if this person gave you uh, 99 to 1 odds against. Uh, uh, in other words, if he said he would give you $99 if you win, but you would have to give him $1 if you lose. 
if we take that and we run that scenario 100 times, we would expect, because you have a 1% chance of winning, that you would lose 99 times and you would win once. So you would have gained the $99 from winning once and you would have lost uh, $1 uh, uh, 99 times. Uh, in other words, you would have broken even. Let's put this simplest probability formula to work a little bit more. Let's say you roll two fair, normal, six-sided dice. What is the probability of their sum being three? What we have here are two images, and they both depict all of the possible results of rolling two dice. So we have six times six equals 36 possible results of rolling two dice. So both the tables uh, uh, contain the same information, just displayed a little differently. I, I tend to like the one on the, on the right. So we have, looking at these tables, we have, well, two. There, there's two conditions in which a three is rolled. And all of the other conditions are different numbers. So the probability of your roll summing to 3 is 2 divided by 36, or 1 divided by 18, if you're a fraction reducer, uh, which is 0 0.055555, repeating, or about 5.6%. These visualizations of all the possible combinations that could come up with the roll are a great introduction to sample space. The sample space is the space containing all the possible outcomes or results of an experiment or an event. If you throw two dice, the result will be one of these combinations. Or at least, if there is a result, it will be one of these combinations. This table is exhaustive. It contains all possible results. Another place where the sample space concept is used is when sampling from a population. Let's say each of these dice represents a person or each of these combinations of dice. All 36 instances represents a person. If I am trying to estimate how my population of 36 people feel on average about whether we should teach critical thinking in grade school, uh, two being strongly disagree, seven being neutral, and 12 being strongly agree, I may, since I can't ask everyone, uh, sample from that population at random. Let's say I randomly select these five individuals to poll and I get their results. The average is 4 plus 6 plus 7 plus 6 again plus 10 divided by 5. Uh, so, so that's 33 divided by 5, 6.6. .6. In other words, the population seems neutral about it, which is probably pretty accurate as we can see that the actual average of the entire population would be seven. Here, what is called sample space is all of the possible combinations of people, or all of the possible samples uh, that could have been obtained. In this context, we can ask of a study or a survey uh, who or what was in its sample space, and we can be you know, critical of attempts to predict outside of it. If, for example, we wanted to draw conclusions about our population of 36 people, but we only had access to possibly sample two-thirds of them, then the results of those two-thirds might not be representative of the population on average. In this case, the average would be low and uh, could uh, especially be not representative of the excluded third. So, so in this case, the excluded third has a very high average. These are the, the, the fives and the sixes combinations. And the two-thirds that constituted our actual sample, our actual sample space, uh, is estimating low. The constrained sample space is unfortunate for our estimate of the average, but it's even worse if we attempt to apply our findings to this excluded third, because our numbers are even more off for them. This brings us to the first rule of probability. What you have needs to sum to 1. So you have a probability uh, of x and a probability of not x, and if you get both of those numbers and add them together, they should sum to 1. If they don't, something's wrong. So this is one way to catch errors in your thinking, is to ask yourself probability questions in two ways. 
what do you think your chances of success are? And then you ask yourself, what do you think your chances of failing are? If these numbers don't sum to one, then there's something in your thinking that might benefit from being addressed. Maybe you're overestimating success. Maybe you are uh, uh, overestimating failure. The beauty of this evaluation is that you know something is off and it is not a matter of differences in opinion. You, on the whole, are contradicting yourself. But let's get back to sample space with an example that uh, isn't dice uh, and is not survey sampling. In probability, the idea of a sample space is very useful for getting one's head around any given problem. This is a question that is uh, by no means intuitive to answer, but go ahead and give it a shot. There is a 75% chance of rain tomorrow and a 75% chance of rain the next day. What is the probability that it will rain in the next two days? I gave this question to the students in my graduate class in Statistics for Forensic Science. So all of them had science undergraduate degrees and all of them were in a graduate level statistics class. And yet, I got four different answers from the class to this question. It's not easy. I invite you to pause and try to work out an answer for yourself to experience the torture that is figuring this out and then not knowing whether you're necessarily 100% correct. Now, of course, there is a formula to help us, and this is called the second law of probability or the sum rule, uh, at least the sum rule for overlapping variables. Uh, but, of course, life doesn't come with instructions for when to apply this particular formula versus the many others that you may recall from high school or university. Here is how you would compute it, but that's not very gratifying because this wouldn't necessarily help me know when to apply this formula in the future. One way we can get the answer without knowing which formula is the correct one and without reinventing the formula with our genius uh, would be to map out the entire sample space and then add up the favorable X or rain events. So what do we have? Let's check it the grunt way. <clears throat> Tomorrow it can only rain or not rain. The day after that it can only rain or not rain. So we have a probability of it raining on both days. That's 0.5 six two five the probability of it raining and then not raining so we're going from left to right here the probability of it raining and then not raining which is 0.1875 the probability of it not raining and then raining which is also 0.1875 and the probability of it not raining and then not raining which is 0 0.0625 the last bit of the sample space is the only bit where it did not rain over those two days. So, so the rest of the probabilities could be added up to give the probability of it raining in the next two days, uh, or you could just subtract the not raining, not raining value, uh, 0 0.0625, from 1. Note that uh, the proportions or the probabilities in sample spaces always have to sum to 1. It's very easy to make a mistake where you forget to multiply two proportions together or something. Uh, so if, if you map out all the possibilities and the total probability is not one, you've either hacked the universe uh, or you have made an error. And what are these different branches in your sample space? These are different realities, and, and the realities don't lie. Before we move on to the third rule of probability, because I'm sure you're all itching for that, let's learn something important. Memorize this sentence. Conditional probabilities are not symmetrical. You don't have to know what it means yet. Just tr try to get the rule into your head. Conditional probabilities are not symmetrical. First, some examples that are 100% obvious. The, the probability that you are Canadian, given that you have been Prime Minister of Canada, is near certain note that we're good scientists and we try not to ever be certain about our estimates. 
But of course, the probability that you will have been Prime Minister of Canada, given that you are Canadian, is supremely unlikely. Okay, conditional probabilities are not symmetrical. So far, nobody will be arguing against this. So let's move on to a similarly obvious, but not quite as obvious example. I happen to be six feet tall. If I see someone taller than myself, the chances are very good that this person is a male. In other words, the probability that the person is a male, given that they are six feet tall or taller, is very high. But this does not mean that most males are over six feet tall. The probability that someone will be over six feet tall, given that they are male, is actually pretty low. Let's get more specific with this example, starting with the second conditional. Since we have Canadian norms, we can compute how likely one is to find a male who is six foot or taller, given one has found a male. Males in Canada average five foot ten inches with a standard deviation of three inches. So being six feet tall would make a male six foot minus five foot ten inches be two inches different from average uh, divided by three. That would make a male uh, who is six foot tall have a Z score of 0.67 and we can convert that to a percentile of 75. In other words anyone six feet and taller is taller than 75 percent of Canadian males. So the specific probability of being over six feet tall given that you are a male is 25 percent or low. Pertaining to the first statement that your probability of being a male given you are over six feet tall is high, we would now need, for comparison, the proportion of females who are six feet or taller. Females in Canada average five foot four inches tall with a standard deviation that at least rounds up to uh, th uh, three inches. So being six feet tall would make a female eight over three, two and two thirds standard deviations above average. This Z score of 2.67 would convert to a, a percentile of about uh, 0.996. In other words, anyone who is six feet tall or taller is taller than 99.6% of Canadian females. But wait, we still haven't figured out the value for the probability in red. What is the probability of someone being male given that they are six feet or taller? Let's lay out our entire sample space. Assume half of Canadians are female and half are male. 99.6% of that 50% of Canadians is under six foot tall. So 49.8% of our population is female and under six feet tall. 0.4% of that 50% of all Canadians is over six foot tall. So 0.2% of our population is female and over six feet tall. Moving on to males, 75% of the half of all Canadians that is male is under six feet tall, so 37.5% of our population is male and under six feet tall. 25% of the half of all Canadians that is male is over six feet tall, so 12.5% of our population is male and over six feet tall. Finally, we just use the definition of probability from earlier. Probability equals the number of outcomes x divided by the total number of outcomes. The total six foot or taller outcomes is uh, 0 0.2 from the females plus 12.5 from the males equaling 12.7. Dividing the males by this total yields 98.4%. 
So, the probability of the person being male, given that they are 6 feet or taller, is 12.5 divided by 12.7, 98.4%. Okay, so, the chance of being 6 foot taller, given you're male in Canada, is 25%, while the chance of being male, given that you are 6 foot or taller in Canada, is 98.4%. This shows us again the usefulness of laying out one's sample space and is a fairly obvious example of how conditional probabilities are not symmetrical. Now for an example that is not so obvious. In forensic science, the most respected test that we have is DNA testing. Now it should go without saying that the probability of getting a DNA match given that we have the actual offender is very very high. If the person we're testing is the guilty party, their DNA will probably match. So far so good. But what we want is the probability that we have the offender given we have a DNA match. And since people share some parts of their DNA and DNA can travel to places in multiple ways, here whether we have the actual offender, given we have a DNA match, is going to depend on a few things. One of the most important things is our false positive rate, which should become obvious in this example. So this is an example from this super fancy expensive textbook called Weight of Evidence for Forensic DNA Profiles. It presents us with the island problem. So we have an island of 101 people and there's a rare latent trait and it shows up in about 1 in 100 individuals in this population. A crime occurs on the island and everybody is suspect. This is murder on the Orient Express style. Everybody's suspicious. But we know that the offender has a rare trait. So the person who committed the crime has this rare 1 in 100 trait and we find an islander with that trait. What is the probability, given only the trait evidence, because remember, everyone's suspect, what's the probability, given only the trait evidence, that the suspect is, in fact, the offender? Now, some of you may be ahead of me, because there are a few shortcuts to solving this one, but let's break it down into probability space, or break it out into probability space. There's 101 islanders. We know this. There's one guilty islander, and there's 100 innocent islanders. Well, so much for the whole Orient Express thing. Let's say that we're guaranteed a match if we test the guilty party. In other words, our test is good enough that we don't have to worry that it's going to miss, it's going to have a false negative. But since the trade occurs in 1 in 100 individuals, we have a false positive discovery rate here of 1 out of 100. So of the 100 innocent islanders, if we tested them all, we would expect to match 1 falsely. And since everyone's a suspect and we have no way of knowing whether the match that we've observed is this 1% likely false match, we end up with the fact that the test is bound to match the guilty party and one innocent party. So the denominator for our simplest equation of probability is going to be 2, and we have one match. That's the correct match. So the probability that we have that correct match is 1 over 2, or 50%. In other words, the chance of getting the trait evidence if the suspect was innocent is small, but the chance of the suspect being innocent, given we found the trait evidence, is still 50-50. The tendency to get confused by this is called the fallacy of the transposed conditional. So we had a probability of a match given that the suspect is innocent, and that is quite low. That was only 1 in 100. But the actual value we care about is the probability that the suspect is guilty or innocent given that we have a match. And that more important question for the trying of fact is what we call evens 0.5.
Put another way, saying this result would be very unlikely if the suspect was innocent does not mean that the suspect is likely guilty. Attempting to transpose the conditional in this way has a special name called the prosecutor's fallacy. So you emphasize the former, which is kind of irrelevant, in order to argue for guilt. The difficulty people tend to have in accepting this particular example of conditional probabilities not being symmetrical, or our tendency to transpose the conditional, is why uh, we started with two examples that are easier. Don't just take my word for it with this example. Work on it until you understand it. Identifying fallaciously transposed conditionals can be a huge benefit to your understanding of things. Uh, for example, if someone is a mass shooter, they are likely mentally ill, a gun owner, and male. This does not mean that being any of these things, nor even all of these things, makes one likely to be a mass shooter. These things could, but the first conditional does not actually imply that they do, despite what our brain wants to do with it. Okay, probability problems, or things your brain tends to do that get in the way of your judgments about uncertainty. First up, gambler's fallacy thinking that independent events are non-independent. So the classic example here is people flip five heads in a row and then they think, well, I must be due for a tails. Uh, so they think that the prior heads have some influence on the next flip of the coin. Of course, they don't, which is not something easy for us to believe. Other examples include this Tim Hortons cup must be a winner because 1 in 10 is a winner and the last 10 cups I had weren't winners. So surely this Tim Hortons cup is going to win me something. Actually, this Tim, particular Tim Hortons cup has absolutely no memory or knowledge or association with those prior Tim Hortons cups you had. It's an independent cup, believe it or not. So, no, this cup is not more likely to be a winner just because prior cups were losers for you. The same logic applies to slot machines. It's a strange reversal of learning to think that I have been losing at this machine for so long that it must be a good decision to keep going because I must be due for a win at this machine. But it's what happens because of the gambler's fallacy. Next, in complement to the gambler's fallacy, we have the law of large numbers. Now, unlike the law of small numbers, which is named as a joke. The law of large numbers is actually a law. If something is rare in the population, let's say, let's say it happens in one in a thousand cases, but you see 2,000 cases, you can expect to see that rare thing. So the law of large numbers says rare things are probable if you have large samples or lots of experience or, or you know if you're cycling through samples often. So the example I like to use because people have actually collected data on this, the, the, the relative risk of, of dying from falling versus uh, dying from a vehicular accident. The example I like to use is you will eventually fall down some stairs. You're gonna fall down some stairs. It, it's probably gonna happen. So let's say this is 0 0.001 percent chance. So that's one in a hundred thousand of you falling down some stairs. If you have traversed stairs more than 100,000 times, it would be expected that you would fall down. Other examples, for every 100 people you encounter, you can expect about one, a uh, little less than one, to be a psychopath. So most of us have probably interacted with psychopaths. If you speed enough, if you drive your car over the speed limit enough, uh, eventually getting a ticket becomes likely. Let's say you're out recreationally shooting hoops and you're shooting from the three-point line. Eventually you will hit one, uh, but uh, unfortunately that doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting better at it. The, the law of large numbers applies here too. Throw enough, throw enough bricks at the basket and eventually one of them will make a sweet, sweet swoosh sound. It, it, it doesn't mean you're any better after that swoosh than you were before. So let's put these together, because these two belong together. First of all, the gambler's fallacy reminds us of independence. In other words, the difficulty of predicting a single given case, even if we have observed plenty of instances. The problem is, the case is independent of other events. If, if we have lots of good data collected, and we, and we understand base rates and everything, 
we will do very well at predicting sets of cases or sets of events because you get the baseline and then you write on the whole. But for any individual case, it's very easy to be embarrassed because it's not necessarily one of the cases that's going to fall in line with the base rate. So the gambler's fallacy reminds us of independence of events and the law of large numbers reminds us of our cumulative risk. In other words, the fact that with enough observations, it is improbable that a rare thing would not occur. The improbable is bound to occur at some point, but at some unknown point, as the gambler's fallacy reminds us. We tend to erroneously turn the law of large numbers into the gambler's fallacy. So, so this one is more likely to win because I'm due. So, you know, ideally people would keep in mind and understand both of these ideas together. The law of large numbers does not validate the gambler's fallacy. The single event that you're trying to make a prediction about, if presuming it is actually independent of prior events, does not care about your past experience. There is also a bit more behind gambling continuance or people continuing to gamble. And it's a more general idea. The sunk cost fallacy. We tend to chase bad money with good. So the fallacy here is we, we think that we can somehow get the lost value back or fix the prior decision that we've made. This is one of the targets that uh, Responsible Gambling Council and other places that try to prevent gambling addiction aim at. There's this idea that we can uh, justify prior losses if the next game turns into a win, or there's the idea that maybe we can win back some losses. There may be some, you know, just world fantasies happening here where you think, well, the, the universe owes me to win this time. But of course, the sunk cost fallacy is probably not manifested in your life as a gambling problem. It's probably manifested as something else. So, has anybody ever made a poor grocery shopping decision, like you bought a bunch of Doritos, uh, and then you said, well, these are terrible for me, but I guess I have to eat them now because I bought them. Well, actually, you don't. You don't have to eat them. You, you could throw them out. I know it seems like you would be wasting money, but if how you really feel is that you shouldn't eat the Doritos, eating them is just further punishing yourself. You've already spent $4 per bag on them. You don't have to also eat them. Maybe your parents or somebody you know has a junker car, a car that is worth probably, you know, like $100 or $50 or maybe negative $50 because you have to pay for the records to come and get it. And, and yet, when it breaks down, they throw money at it. A $2,500 repair on your transmission in order to fix a van that is not worth $1,000 anymore is a bad idea. And yet, people make this call all the time. The classic uh, example of the sunk cost fallacy comes from Amos Tversky. He famously would sit through the first 10 minutes of a movie and then make the executive decision to either leave or stay. So if he didn't like the first 10 minutes of the movie, he would leave. And he'd just tell his family, he'd be like, well, I'll be at home reading or something. I don't like this movie. And so he'd go. People would say, well, you wasted your money. You left. And then Amos would say, Okay, well, let me put it this way. If I wasted my money, why should I also waste my time? From the probably the person who could be considered its progenitor. And you could observe the sunk cost fallacy in other contexts as well, such as investing your time or energy or your belief or emotions into something. The continued investment that seems to be a bad decision appears justified to us in part because we think we're reasonable people. So there could be aspects, in other words, of cognitive dissonance here, or what we've called doubling down. The unfortunate logic goes roughly, if this were a bad idea, then I wouldn't keep doing it. So then we deny the consequent in this if-then statement. If this were a bad idea, then I wouldn't keep doing it. So we deny the consequent. In other words, we keep doing it. Then we conclude validly, therefore, it's not a bad idea. So valid, great, valid reasoning. It, it's, it, it's not a bad idea because I keep doing it. Not great, but valid. Though what you see is all there is fallacy. Our tendency to only include in our planning and deciding the things we know about and to not include room for unknowns. It's very difficult to include room for unknowns. What this might look like for an undergrad is planning out when you will do your work, when you'll write your assignments, etc. But giving yourself maybe a 10 or a 20% buffer in case 
you get sick or in case something turns out to be more difficult than you thought or in case your computer crashes or something like that. We would typically fail to do that because when you look at a calendar, it doesn't have yellow flashing lights of warning on it. The calendar has space. It has room. How am I going to fill this space? Which is one of the best things about having uh, deadlines is it prevents you from stretching the work out over too long of a time period. So we tend not to account for emergencies or sicknesses or uh, difficult people that we may have to deal with or the estimation error that we might have. So let's say I'm going to estimate that it's going to take me 20 hours to write a, a five-page essay. I could account for estimation error by saying, well, let's just add in three more hours, just in case it takes me three more hours. Something else we tend not to plan for is competition. A lot of my students are very high achievers, and a lot of them have a life plan that follows roughly the same logic or trajectory. I am going to study to be the best and most knowledgeable individual in my field. I'm going to have lots of experience in order to be able to jump straight to important positions that require such experience. I'm going to do this simultaneously so I get my degree, and I'd be the best of my degree and the best of my field. And I think, well, if I do that, then, then I'll get a job. But I just said that a lot of my students do that, so a lot of them are going to be competing for the same position. So they do everything right, and they still end up, after being perfect, they still end up competing with other perfect people for the position that they want. But you don't see those other people, those other students, working their ass off like you. You see your own efforts, and you see all you put into it. One thing I want to drive home with the what you see is all there is fallacy is that this is an almost impossible task to counteract this fallacy and actually try to see everything that is not currently in front of you. None of us could have been prepared for COVID-19. Or put another way, nobody opened up a contingency plan binder once, once we found out what was happening. Nobody just went to their shelf calmly, opened up a contingency plan binder marked viral pandemic, and is currently just going through it step by step. Glad that they had planned ahead. An antidote to the what you see is all there is fallacy is asking oneself, what do we not know or what knowledge or data do we not have that might be useful? The difference between this and the availability heuristic, since many things could be described as both. Uh, for example, if someone wants to argue to their town council to lower the speed limit, they may bring someone into the chambers who was injured by a car. Uh, and this might be persuasive because there's a lot of work in there. Uh, availability, saliency, pathos, uh, in addition to our what you see is all there is tendency to not zoom out and ask contextualizing questions that might show us how little we have thought through the situation. The difference between uh, what you see is all there is and the availability heuristic is that the former, what you see is all there is, is a more specific indictment of not considering things other than what is salient, whereas the latter, at the availability heuristic, is a description of what tends to happen when we do consider the alternatives. However, cursorily or hastily, we lean toward the decision for which it is easier to think of confirming or affirming cases. So sometimes this easiness is a good trick to use, and sometimes, like vehicle crashes versus falling or Trump versus Lillane Betancourt, it leads us astray. With what you see is all there is, we've started to encroach upon the world of planning. So there's something just called planning bias, which, since they are our plans, the bias is likely a flavor of my side bias. In other words, planning bias might be due to overestimating ourselves. So here's an example of planning bias. Scottish Parliament. The initial budget for building Scottish Parliament was... 10 to 40 million pounds. That was the range. They said 10 to 40 million pounds. This was in July of 1997. Next year, so 1998 in July, they said, well, we need a little more money. The actual budget now is somewhere between 50 million pounds and 55 million pounds. Okay. 11 months later, June of 1999, the budget goes up to 109 million pounds. 10 months later, April 2000, the budget increases from 109 million to 195 million pounds. 
November 2001, it goes up to 241 million pounds. December 2002, 300 million pounds. September 2003, 400 million pounds. And keep in mind that with some of these increases, they put in specific wording saying this is the absolute last time we will raise the budget for this. And then they just they just rescinded that wording. They were like, well, we need more money. We can't go back now. The final cost of building Scottish Parliament was 414.4 million pounds. So this is more than an order of magnitude. It's more than 10 times the cost initially budgeted. We see problems with the inside view and planning bias in entrepreneurs. In the U.S., only 35% of small businesses stay in business for more than five years. If we call this more than five years success, then we have a 65% rate of failure. But if we ask entrepreneurs to estimate their chance of success, not surprisingly, the average answer is more than 35%. Uh, it's consistently over 70%. In other words, there's a clear Lake Wobegon effect here where there are definitely plenty of wrong entrepreneurs overestimating themselves. But let's put this into perspective. We arguably need this bias in order to have industry and awesome developments. Uh, pointing out that most entrepreneurs are wrong about their anticipated success is not to say that the world would be better if they adjusted their thinking. I think the world would be worse if we all had a more accurate but uninspiring, depressive sort of realism. Entrepreneurs will also estimate the chance of success for a business like theirs at about 60%. Uh, but of course, their estimates of their own success are over 70. So in other words, there's a my side or inside view bias that translates to at least on average uh, a 10% boost in their prediction of their own success. At the more extreme end, we see the individuals who may be throwing off the average here because one third, 33% of the entrepreneurs we asked estimated that they themselves have a 0% chance of failure. Where of course, if you take them at random, they actually have a 65% chance of failure. It's worth reminding ourselves of the Lake Wobegon effect since it is one of the ways that we can empirically see how prevalent my side bias is in the world. So in Thinking Fast and Slow, Kahneman observed, uh, and this is a quote, most people genuinely believe that they are superior to most others on most desirable traits. They are willing to bet small amounts of money on these beliefs in the laboratory. That would be a pretty easy way to make money, right? You get people to bet that they're better than the average driver, and guess what? Most of them fail. 90% of drivers think they're above average drivers. I'm actually impressed that 10% admit that they're not. 95% of teachers think that they are better than average teachers. Generally, the more you value a trait, the more likely you are to think that you are above average in it. Now this is in part because we devalue traits that we are not high in or skills that we're not good at. How many people do you know who think that math is not important in the real world? Well, guess what? It's, it's only gaining in importance. Look, look at the flatten the curve rally and cry. It presumes a knowledge of how frequency distributions work. Mathematics is the new literacy, is, is the new being able to read. And we're in the Middle Ages. We're in medieval times uh, in terms of mathematical literacy rates. Go ahead and Google MSNBC math error. If you haven't seen it yet, Google MSNBC math error and, and have, have a fun five minutes considering the sad future of humanity. Go ahead, I'll wait. The, the reported fact that's being relayed by Brian Williams and the New York Times editor was numerically off by six orders of magnitude. That's like if you asked me to guess Brian Williams' weight and I said, well, he's probably 200 million pounds. It's unsettling that, that those were giving the most responsibility to inform us. The New York Times editor and the primetime news anchor can relay such mathematically illiterate information and that this is increasingly the new normal as math and data and reasoning from them becomes more important. Devaluing is actually one of the psychodynamicists' borderline 
types of defense mechanisms. In other words, if you tend to devalue things that you're not good at, it could indicate a pathological personality, i.e. that you're not functioning well in the world. Now there are some exceptions to the Lake Wobegon effect. For example, most people rate themselves as below average at starting conversations with strangers. So in other words, they think that the average person is better at it than they are. But before we think that this is some form of humility, let's put it in context. When we ask people, especially young people, to rate how good their social skills are, between 90 and 99% say that they are above average. This may just seem like cute self-affirmation, but these beliefs are killing people. Most people think that they are above average at multitasking, including if we specifically ask them about texting while driving, which in simulation studies is roughly twice as dangerous as driving while moderately intoxicated with alcohol. So one can know that it is dangerous for the average person, but they can think that they're above average and therefore it's not dangerous for them. And thanks to the Lake Wobegon effect, everybody can think this about themselves. Overconfidence. Most of us tend to overestimate the likelihood of our own success. In one study, we had chief financial officers predict stock performance, and we measured how sure they were that their predictions were correct. And in order to stack the deck in their favor, we took only the cases for which they were at least 90% confident in their predictions, meaning they should be wrong at most only 10% of the time. And we saw whether they were correct or not. They were correct 67% of the time, meaning they were wrong 33% of the time. This may look like they were doing pretty well, correct 67% of the time. But what we care about is the disconnect between their confidence and their accuracy. So there's two ways to look at this, and neither paints a very positive picture. First, they were wrong more than three times more often than they thought they would be. And this is after filtering out their less than 90% confident predictions and is in the context of deliberate and observed performance. In other words, this is the best that they can do. Another way of looking at it is that one third of their near certain predictions were wrong. And these are the people at the top making the big decisions. Keep in mind, we're not expecting them to never be wrong. We're only expecting their estimates of their confidence to be reflective of their actual correctness. It's one thing to be wrong when you make a decision. It's another thing to be wrong when you make a decision about which you claim certainty. Related to overconfidence is our illusion of control. We are very unlikely to admit that our hitting a three-pointer would have been luck or the law of large numbers coming into effect. In fact, we tend to grossly overweight the role of skill. Following up on the inside view or my side bias of the entrepreneurs, we were asking startup employees and founders the following question. To what extent will the firm's success depend on what you do in the firm? Responses were nearly always greater than 80%. In other words, more than 80% of the success of the firm is dependent on me. In other words, something about these individuals, these startup employees and founders, is what matters. Not the market, the timing, the location, etc. Success is 80% dependent on me. Again, this belief is adaptive and constructive, gets people to take responsibility, but clearly it's not accurate. This is an illusion but we can see how helpful and constructive it would be to believe it. Finally, we have something that we've already seen in the context of the entrepreneur's base rate neglect. Specifically, the entrepreneurs seemed to ignore the fact that most new businesses fail in the first five years. This is especially true of the one-third of respondents who said that they have zero chance of failing. Another example of this requires a bit more setup. Recall the bystander non-intervention studies. Individuals were put into situations where it would be normal to act or respond to the situation. 
one condition involved sitting in a laboratory and then seeing smoke coming in from under the door. It turns out that individuals are much slower to act and less likely to act at all if there are other individuals sitting around doing nothing. Now most of the other scenarios involved helping other individuals, so the woman in distress or the student having a seizure. It turns out that if other individuals are standing around or sitting around doing nothing, you are less likely to do something yourself. Now this does not mean that people in the real world will not help if there's a problem. This is artificial in that the individuals standing around the subject of the experiment are confederates paid to do nothing. This tends not to be the case in the real world. So when people are alone, they respond with action, and when they are surrounded by individuals doing nothing, they tend more to respond by doing nothing. The study I want to talk about is not any of the bystander effect studies. It is a study in which we were asking students questions about the bystander effect study. We had them look at videos of people that we said participated in the bystander effect study. They would look at short videos where the person introduced themselves, and then the subjects had to predict whether the person in the video they just watched helped or did not help when they were in the bystander study. And these participants were randomized to two conditions. Uh, in condition one, they were informed about the base rate of helping. So the main point of the bystander effect studies is that helping is very low when there are others standing around doing nothing. So for this study, we said that the base rate of helping was 27%. In other words, these individuals that you're going to see videos of and then predict whether they intervened or not, whether they helped or not, only 27% of them actually intervened or helped. The other condition was not given this base rate information. They were just asked to state whether the individuals helped or did not help. They did not have base rate information. They didn't know the results of the study. They were just described the study and asked to make predictions. What we found was that in the second condition, in the condition where people didn't know that only 27% of participants helped, these subjects, when they looked at videos of participants, predicted that nearly all of the individuals helped. So the subject watches a neat little video and says, Hi, I'm Terence. I go to X university and I study this and I really like cats and I really like James Joyce. And then the subject has to predict based on that or decide based on that whether the individual helped or did not help in the study. And in condition two, when students don't know that only 27% of individuals helped, they say basically everybody helped. In condition one, when we told students that only 27% of participants helped, the results were they predicted that nearly everybody helped. But wait, we told these participants that only 27%, only a quarter of the individuals helped, and yet at the end, they had predicted that nearly all of them helped. There were zero differences between conditions. Having the base rate information did not help the people in condition one. Having knowledge that only 27% of the people helped did not help the people in condition one to make better predictions. Both groups predicted that nearly every individual helped in the bystander effect study. In other words, these research participants neglected the base rate. Even though they were told about the base rate, they neglected it. And this research finding is one of the reasons why the old guard in psychology, the people that have been around for a long time, tend to say things like, you can't teach students psychology. You can teach students facts, and students can memorize them, but very few students, and maybe even no students, because some people are old and cranky and they'll say things like that, will actually learn psychology from you. The example here would be if we asked the people from condition one to say what percent of individuals helped in the bystander effect studies on a multiple choice test. They would answer correctly, most of them would answer correctly, that only 27% of participants helped. And yet, those same students, when it came time to predict whether 
individual members of this same group about which they know only 27 percent helped to predict each individual's helping they failed miserably so they knew the fact but they did not know how to use it or how to contextualize things in light of the fact the participants learned something but they didn't know something so how can we address some of these probability problems some good news is that we can hack our system using its vulnerabilities let's take the law of small numbers as an example so the fallacy that general truths can be inferred from observing only a few cases let's combine this with the salience of a story so we're trying to teach our research participants about the 27 percent base rate of helping in a way that gets it deep enough that they will actually apply this learning to their future decision making what we could do is when we show the video of a participant and the subject incorrectly guesses that the person in the video helped we could say can you believe that even this lady didn't help the law of small numbers says we're going to treat this salient case this individual case as if it represents a general truth in this way we get the 27 percent base rate from being a fact on the surface that one would answer correctly on a multiple choice test to being something that might actually be incorporated into their future predictions this is using a fallacy the law of small numbers to teach something accurate the use of base rates other tools we have include the four cell approach to avoid planning bias and uh, what you see is all there is types of oversights let's take building the Scottish Parliament as our example and we're gonna fill in the quadrants with language that comes from Donald Rumsfeld's response to a question about Iraq and weapons of mass destruction he said reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because as we know there are known knowns there are things we know we know we also know there are known unknowns that is to say we know there are some things we do not know but there are also unknown unknowns the ones we don't know we don't know and if one looks throughout the history of our country and other free countries it is the latter category that tends to be the difficult ones so Rumsfeld gives us three quadrants so we have uh, uh, known knowns known unknowns and unknown unknowns but reasonably speaking we could also say that there are unknown knowns or, or surprises so the known known is what you know that you know uh, the unknown known it would be a bonus is, is something you knew that you didn't know you knew uh, there are known unknowns something you know will vary but you don't know specifically how uh, and you have unknown unknowns something you you just can't with any accuracy predict because it wasn't on your radar to begin with so for a known known in building the Scottish Parliament you're going to know what the cost of cement is great for an unknown known let's say you are a local bidder uh, and you are bidding against companies that are not local you might not realize that you have this strength but you probably know about the reliability of the weather and how to plan for you know what's gonna happen with certain seasons how wet it's gonna be etc so that might be an unknown known that you have a little bonus that you didn't realize you could, you could use to your advantage and then there are known unknowns anybody who knows a contractor knows that people are constantly changing your their minds they're adding things on to contracts projects change and generally get more expensive this is a known unknown I know that I don't know how much the project is going to change but I generally know the direction it's going to be in and of course there's unknown unknowns when they were building the TTC line to York University they hadn't planned for a death on the job site and the death on the job site shut things down for about a year I mean they were already way behind schedule and over budget but they also lost about a year to this job site death that could likely adequately be called an unknown unknown here's another version of a four cell table 
In this case, we're looking at Toronto Public Health's mulling over of the decision of whether or not to release HIV protection pills. So these are pills that would reduce your risk of contracting HIV by 75%. Well, as long as the pill is safe, why wouldn't we just automatically give these pills to people? Well, the concern of Toronto Public Health was, what if giving people this pill leads them to be less careful in other regards? Specifically, what if people go from being regular faithful condom users to using condoms less frequently? Because we know about your risk of transmission if you're using condoms versus your risk of transmission if you are inconsistently using condoms. The risk estimates are very approximate, but one is far more likely to transmit HIV if they are an inconsistent condom user versus a consistent condom user. One thing we could do is we could compute the 75% reduction and see what the risk for individuals is if they take the drug. So if you're taking the drug and you're using condoms, the 75% reduction of your original risk ends up being a 0.5% chance of HIV transmission. If you are an inconsistent condom user, your risk goes from 15% to 3.75% on the pill. So what Toronto Public Health was concerned about is migration from the 2% cell to the 3.75% cell. What if people who use condoms regularly migrate to the inconsistent use category as a function of having taken the pill? We know that if everyone who uses condoms regularly changes to inconsistent use after being on the drug, we can expect nearly a doubling of HIV transmission in those who migrated cells from 2% to 3.5%. Such a complete cell migration or behavioral change would likely not actually happen, but it is a contingency that the Toronto Public Health would have to be responsible for if it happened. Without knowing the base rate of how many use condoms regularly and how many do not, we can't say whether, in a situation of 100% cell migration, HIV transmission would be overall going up or down. If nearly everyone was using condoms regularly, then the introduction of this HIV protection pill, if it made all of them do so inconsistently, then, in this hypothetical scenario, Toronto Public Health's intervention would increase HIV infection. This is why Toronto Public Health was concerned. But of course the pill was released. So, that was the four-cell approach to mapping out reality, and at the end there, we came across the importance of base rates. How many cases are represented by or expectable in each cell? That could have helped Toronto Public Health make a decision. The usual example uh, to show the importance of base rates, or to introduce Bayesian statistics and its use of the base rate more generally, involves a positive breast cancer screening result which we then translate into one's actual probability of having breast cancer given the positive test result, which, spoiler alert, is actually contingent upon how rare breast cancer is. Uh, we can do this roughly with the numbers available for HIV, though. So the base rate is how often something occurs in the long run. If you are a randomly selected Canadian, your base rate risk of HIV infection is roughly 0.007%. Roughly, the sensitivity for an HIV screening test is 99.99%. In other words, if you have it, the test will find it 99.99% .99 of the time. So your chance of a false negative or it being missed by the test is 1 in 10,000. The specificity of a screening test, 99.98%. So if you do not have HIV, the test will say you do not have it 99.98% of the time. So the test works in both directions. Your chance of a false positive is 1 in 5,000. So here's another fourfold table. It contains all of reality. You either have HIV or you don't, and the test either says you have HIV or it doesn't. It's an amazing test, but it's looking for something that is quite rare. Given that a random Canadian's base rate risk of diagnosed HIV infection is roughly 0.007%. What is the chance that you have HIV given that you have tested positive? Here's how you would do the math to figure that out. You multiply sensitivity by base rate and you divide it by sensitivity times base rate plus 
the false positive risk times 1 minus the base rate, which looks like this, which yields 25.9%. Even though it is an amazing test with 99.9% even though it is an amazing test with amazing sensitivity and amazing specificity, the thing that it's looking for is so rare that even when it has said it has found it, it probably hasn't. So what would we do or decide in that case? Normally, we would then take a different type of test, des test designed less for sensitivity and more for specificity. But let's say we take the same type of test again. What we could do is we could use 25.9% as our new base rate. So we're upgrading our base rate from 0.007% to 25.9%. If our second test is positive again, well then we punch in the new base rate and then we figure out that we can be 99.9% .9 confident that HIV is present. Okay, so it took two tests showing a positive result to get us to 99.9% .9 confident. What if this second test came back negative? How would we figure out how confident we can be in this negative result? We would have to swap out sensitivity for specificity and take 1 minus the disease base rate as our non-disease base rate in order to compute the following specificity times base rate divided by specificity times base rate plus false negative risk times 1 minus base rate which looks like this and yields 99.996 percent confidence that HIV is not present so we can see that even though we have an amazing test if we change the base rates the accuracy of the test changes so the base rate or the prevalence of something is an important part of interpreting any given test results. Despite this, some of the people we pay the most to keep society going tend to make rather egregious base rate errors. The general rule regarding statistical literacy is that 80% of whatever group you are testing will misapply statistical concepts, and this includes statisticians and instructors of statistics courses who uh, for example, tend to misapply null hypothesis testing concepts. It includes medical doctors who tend not to understand or apply base rates with respect to tests, and to the judge who stated the following. The test is of high quality. Doing the test again is not a fruitful use of the court's time. This is a quote from a case where the judge could have ordered a second test just like we did with HIV a couple slides ago, to rule out a false positive. But he did not, based on the fact that the test has high sensitivity and specificity. Being high in these things is good, of course, but it does not make the test free of error. This is a quote from a case where the judge could have ordered a second test to rule out a false positive, which is what we did two slides ago with our HIV example. But the judge didn't order a second test, and he based it on the fact that the test has high sensitivity and specificity, well, just like the HIV test. Being high in these things is good, but it does not make the test free of error. If anything, it's an endorsement for using the test again, for do running that second test. The man on trial who was denied a second test spent a decade in prison before somebody finally re-ran the test and the first result was in fact a false positive. He was set free but he could have had a decade of his life not stolen away if the judge had been a bit more literate in how error base rates worked. Note that the judge had transposed the conditional and conflated the low chance of error given guilt with a high chance of guilt given the result. That's probably enough for today.